So welcome to the diffusion of gases. So hopefully you've had some time to read through a little bit of this chapter already before going to this lecture. If you like to do it the other way where we go through the lecture and then through the chapter, that's okay as well. Uh, so when we're going through this, I just want you to have a, a better understanding that when we talk about diffusion of pulmonary gases, this gets to be very, very critical if you work in critical care medicine as well as in diagnostic medicine and even in home care respiratory medicine. This is going to have applications all across the span of respiratory therapy. And when we're looking at this, we talked about the movement of gas being on pressure gradients, right? Trans airway pressure, trans pulmonary pressure, all these pressure gradients help drive the movement of gas. But as you know, in the respiratory zone, the gas is not moving. It is based upon molecular uh, movement. And and this is what we have down in the respiratory zone, the AC membrane, we're looking at a process called passive diffusion. This is where the molecules cross the alveoli and capillary membrane because they passively diffuse with those with this gradient. So diffusion is just the movement of gas molecules, so very, very tiny molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So that's what we're looking at when we're seeing these alveolar capillary membrane, when we have the alveoli and the capillary that's going through here. In my venous blood, so let's go do purple here. In my venous blood, my PVO2 should be lower than, let's do green, my P big A, alveolar air, O2. So let's say my P big A O2 is 100 millimeters of mercury, okay? My PVO2, let's just say it is, I don't know, 60. Well, 60 is kind of high. Let's just say my PVO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so when we have venous blood going through the pulmonary artery, traveling its way to the respiratory zone, we have a PVO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury and a PVO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury. So Remember, we move from high concentration to low concentration. So therefore, when the alveoli sees this disparity of pressure because it wants to go at equilibrium, the alveoli is going to give oxygen to that blood, right? And so when we're looking at the same thing over here, so that's oxygen, right? We see venous blood being deficient and alveolar being uh, excessive. So that's why we have that exchange until they reach equilibrium. So when we have this over here, when we're looking at the alveolar capillary membrane and we're looking at CO2 of venous blood. So P, sorry, let's go to green. P A CO2. So alveolar CO2 levels, and this is usually around 40 millimeters of mercury. And then your venous blood, it's somewhere around PVCO2. Let's just say it's around 40, um, let's just say it's around 46 millimeters of mercury. So when we see this, we still have a pressure gradient, right, for diffusion of gas across the alveolar capillary membrane. See, we have the diffusion gradient of 40 being less in the lungs than we do in our venous blood. So therefore, that CO2 is going to diffuse out of the blood and into the alveoli because there's a diffusion gradient of high, which is in venous, to CO2 in the capillaries, which is low, right? So it always still goes from a concentration of high to low when we're talking about that pressure gradient. And so that diffusion becomes very important and the diffusion is gonna have a lot of variables that could change. So we're gonna have a lot of patients that are very, very sick and their diffusion of gas across the alveolar capillary membrane is going to be very low. So what's way we, one way we can compensate for this? So if their diffusion into their bloodstream is very, very low, then I'm going to do everything I can to increase my P big AO2 to that way it can get 
even more diffusion so I can get an adequate oxygen level to my kidneys, to my heart, to my brain, all those organs that need to stay alive. I need to do something, and our fix is usually going to do something to increase that P big AO2. So that relationship between P the alveolar gas and the venous slash capillary gas that you're looking at there is a very important relationship and that's what this chapter is going to give a little bit better view on how we look at this relationship at the AC membrane because when it comes down to it and then it's very late and we'll talk about different diseases when it comes down to it this is going to be determining is your patient having a hard time getting oxygen in their bloodstream or getting CO2 out of their bloodstream because this relationship here, this alveolar capillary relationship, is that a dysfunctional relationship? And that's what you're going to be looking at here. If we see that their diffusion is good, that this relationship is functioning well, then we know the problem is not in the lungs. We know the problem could be cardiovascular, it could be metabolic, it could be something else. But we need to make sure that we evaluate when someone has hard time getting oxygen into their bloodstream we need to be be sure to evaluate is their diffusion a cause of the issue right is their diffusion a cause of the issue and that's what this chapter kind of looks at so you're going to go through a lot of different things here but we're going to be looking at that passive diffusion between two areas that are in equilibrium here okay so here's the big thing. Well, you need to be sure of the definition of diffusion. You can guarantee I will ask you this on exam two as well. Uh, know your gas laws. This should be review from your uh, science class where you talked about the Boyle's, Gay-Lussac's, um, Charles, Dalton's law. Um, we'll go over Graham's and Fix as well and Henry's. So we'll go over some diffusions as well as regular gas laws as well. So you do need to know those. I will expect you to know those. So there's your warning, right? Uh, I do want you to know the gases that make up the barometric pressure. So what percent and partial pressure, right? You know that most of the gas that you're breathing right now, and I don't think any of you are wearing supplemental oxygen, uh, most of the gas you're breathing now is almost 80% nitrogen right the rest of it is oxygen and there's some trace gases in there too but our focus is on that 21% uh, oxygen the rest of it being uh, nitrogen and trace gases there so that's what we're looking at here what percentages make up the partial pressure and then we'll talk about Dalton's law there uh, so the partial pressures of, of gas in the air alveoli and blood vessels and we'll get into why that gets to be important uh, when we're going through this and especially as you guys advance down the road to critical care medicine especially that's part of what you'll be doing in school even if you plan on not working there it'll still be valuable for your school experience because it's going to be a big thing when we're looking at who's to blame is it the lungs the heart both cardiovascular is it a metabolic issue we need to find what's causing this patient's issues and knowing the different areas within the body and how they're functioning or what their relationships are is going to be very helpful in patient care right you're going to be able to calculate this and say hey their lungs are not the problem let's look elsewhere and then we can focus our resources more efficiently and quicker to help that patient get better faster right so calculating the alveolar air equation is going to be part of this hopefully you already had some practice with this it sounds like you guys have had practice with this but hey guess what one of the worksheets has you practice this so make sure you're calculating your alveolar air equation you know it you can do it for the test and then we'll go over the a to a gradient of course which we've already talked about in some of our uh, meetings as well uh, naming the structures that make up the AC membrane and how the gas goes through it and diffuses is going to be something that helps you better understand how that diffusion can be impeded or how that diffusion can be improved, right? How it can be uh, harder to diffuse and how it can be easier to diffuse. So it's going to give you a better idea knowing the structures that are there that helps you sort of understand that a little bit better.
Uh, number seven down there, explain how oxygen and CO2 normally diffuse across the AC membrane. We just previewed that a little bit, but we'll go into more detail. Uh, know the laws of diffusion, Henry's, Graham's, Dalton's, so, uh, so on and so forth. So we'll go over, uh, or fix, yeah. So we'll go over those uh, as well. So if that's something that you uh, did in science class, great. This will be mostly review for you then. Um, but if that's something that you need more review with, then welcome. Welcome. All right. Know the difference between perfusion limited and diffusion limited uh, gas flow. And so we'll get into that at the very end there. And I think that even the red blood cell PowerPoint and the CO2 PowerPoint later on, we'll talk about that even more and why there's a difference and what it means to you as a respiratory therapist. Okay, so this is something that we were looking at before, and this is just looking at uh, your conversions. Uh, now, we just want to make sure I do see uh, conversion issues when we look at the exams. Uh, a lot of people, um, not a lot of people, but there are some students that do have a hard time with conversions in between milliliters and liters or in between pounds and kilograms and so on. So just want to make sure that you, you can go through this and understand, okay, converting back and forth in between um, milliliters and liters uh, is going to be something that could be very, very useful to you, uh, but understand to take it slowly. That's okay uh, to avoid making some of those mistakes. So liters per minute to liters per second, right? You already know that you need to divide by 60 to turn it to liters per second, especially if you're calculating airway resistance, which is pressure overflow in liters per second. So like when we go over dead space and I give you someone's weight in kilograms, then you need to convert it to pounds and then you can do one ml per pound for dead space, right? And then you can calculate their alveolar minute ventilation down the road. So understand, I will ask you conversion. I might might say, hey, someone weighs 68 kilos or 80 kilos, what's their weight in pounds? And you'd be like, oh, that's 176, right? So understand your conversion factor. Remember for kilos and pounds, it's 2.2, right? You will always like your weight in kilograms because it's half and then 10%. Um, so when you're looking at that, it's 2.2, right? So 80 times 2.2 would be around 176 there, right? So this is just a screen to make sure that you are able to convert back and forth and that you are comfortable with that. So that's something I, uh, I can almost guarantee I will ask you to do. That's something we have to do in the hospital at least uh, as well. So every once in a while, we'd still get height in centimeters. Uh, the height in centimeters, they would say, oh, a patient's coming out from heart surgery and they're 126 centimeters tall or something like that. Then you would have to divide by 2.54 and to get their height in inches. So we know their ideal body weight. So we could set the tidal volume on the ventilator at around seven mils per uh, kilo of either ideal body weight. So this is something we have to do, right? I'm not expecting you to be making those experience calculations like tell me someone's tidal volume based upon their height in centimeters, right? I'm not asking you to do that here. I'm just saying there will be benefit to knowing these conversions down the road because we do have to do those. All right, so this is sort of an example of a problem that was in one of your uh, uh, worksheets, and so that way you sort of feel a little bit more comfortable with this. So this is a whole thing, and we'll go through this together. Mr. Beals weighs 180 pounds and is at his ideal body weight. Hey, congratulations, Mr. Beals, right? He's breathing at a respiratory rate of 12 breaths per minute, and his tidal volume is 6.3 milliliters per kilogram. Oh, heavens. So now this is going to be asking me to do some things here. So I want to know what his tidal volume is. Okay. Well, I know that we're going to have to end up eventually converting some of these factors. So when I'm looking at this, 81.2 kilograms, right? He's at his ideal body weight. So I'm going to take his ideal body weight, which is 180 pounds, 
and divided by 2.2, which is 81.2 kilograms. That's that first red bullet point there, right? That's the math on the right, and then that's the answer on the left there. Hopefully, you, you, you guys can all see that. When we look at that, okay, now I know he's... He's roughly 81.2 kilos. That's going to help me down the road. All right, so the first question overall is what is his tidal volume? Well, how do we figure this out? His tidal volume is 6.3 milliliters per kilogram. Oh, heavens. What do we do here? Well, 6.3 milliliters per kilogram. We can do cross multiplication, and if that's something that sends you into a little bit of anxiety, that's okay. You can always uh, convert this back to uh, mLs per pound. Um, but when we do this, uh, if you do the cross multiplication, he gets to be around 510 mLs, right? That's his tidal volume at, at 6.3 milliliters per kilogram okay so that tells me how deep he's breathing now that's great that's his depth of breathing but how much external respiration how much exchange with the respiratory zone is going on well that's why i need to subtract dead space to see how much of that one breath that 510 mls actually exchange gas with the respiratory zone so when i'm doing this i'm going to take uh 81 times the dead space so 81 is his uh, his kilos. So if you do uh, 1 ml per pound is the same as 2.2 mls per kilo. And so you can pick whichever one you want to pick here for doing the conversion. You can either do their kilograms times 2.2 or you can convert to pounds which is we already know 180. So we know it's 180 mls. Right. So whichever one you prefer. Right. So 1 ml per 2.2 uh, 2.2 kilograms or 1 ml per pound of ideal body weight. So we know his dead space is 180 mLs. Okay, so out of that 510 mL breath, 180 of it does not reach the respiratory zone. It gets caught up in the conducting zone. Remember, you have FRC and uh, ERV and RV and all that stuff. So you're not, you don't exchange 100% of your lung volume with each breath. Some of it will stay in the conducting zone. So how much of that uh, stayed in the conducting zone? Well, about 180 mLs, right? That did not get exchanged. So that means at the alveolar level, out of this 510 mL breath, he only took in 330 mLs that went to his respiratory zone. Okay, well that's just one breath, right? So over the course of a minute will help me tell better what's going on with this patient because every time you and I take a breath, it's gonna be at a different volume or a different rate, especially if we're talking, things like that. So over the course of a minute will help us get a better idea of how effective their ventilation is overall. So if I want to just see how much gas this patient, Mr. Beals, is moving over the course of an entire minute, then I'm just going to take their respiratory rate, which in this case is 12, times their tidal volume, right, which is 510. So when I get that, I get 6.2 liters per minute, or 6,100 and 20 mls per minute right we don't like to use like anything in the uh thousands and all that stuff so that's why usually we'll do 6.2 liters instead of 6200 mls you can give me the full length you're in first semester that is okay with me but understand realistically uh if you want to set a good habit for yourself convert that to liters which is just moving the decimal space over right so 6.12 liters per minute so this Mr. Beals is breathing 6.12 liters per minute. That's how much gas is moving into and out of their respiratory system. Well, does that represent everything that's being exchanged at the alveolar capillary membrane? No, right? Remember, we're going to lose some of that. So in other words, to figure out how much of the gas that they're breathing over the course of a minute actually has exchange of CO2 and O2, we're going to do the same equation. We're going to take their respiratory rate, but instead of using their regular tidal volume, we're going to use their alveolar tidal volume. So we're still going to use their respiratory rate, 
but now we're going to use their alveolar volume. So you just take 12 in this case times 330, right? And that will give us 3.96 liters per minute. So in other words, out of the um, 6.12 liters per minute that they're exchanging overall, 3.96 liters of it actually exchange CO2 and oxygen. That's how efficient their body was at external respiration, which is what ultimately counts. That's what actually exchanges the CO2 and O2. So that's the area that we're really concerned about. How efficient is their respiratory zone? Well, this tells us that the respiratory zone here, a normal is around four liters per minute. So that is more than within uh, that 10% range there. So this person, Mr. Beals, has very good alveolar minute ventilation. So that's good, right? That tells us that is functioning well. Uh-oh, we have more information about Mr. Beals. While taking a breath, he generates a five centimeter water pressure change at a flow rate of 45 liters per minute. Uh-oh, sounds like we're going to calculate some stuff here. All right, so the first thing I wanna know here is how stretchy are his lungs, right? What's the lung compliance on Mr. Beals here? So this is where you should remember the calculation for compliance is your change in volume over your change in pressure, right? So we're gonna put 510 on top and 510 over 5, right? That's our change of pressure. So we get a lung compliance of 102 milliliters per centimeter of water pressure, or 0.102 liters per centimeter water pressure. So let me ask you this. Is this normal, high, or low? Well, it's greater than 100, so you could make the case for it being high. However, it's still within that 10% of being uh of the normal value so we would still probably realistically consider this within normal limits uh, even though it's greater than 100 uh, in this case we'll just call it pretty normal right 102 mls per centimeter water pressure normal is 100 mls per centimeter water pressure okay so we got lung compliance that's normal to high right depending if you go by the 100 being perfect or 100 within 10 percent above and below all right, now I'm going to ask you what Mr. Beal's airway resistance is. So now that's asking me, great, now i got to remember how to calculate air resistance. Well, air resistance is the change in pressure over the flow in liters per second. Flow in liters per second right? Remember, flow is just volume over time. It's the time part of it. So volume is just volume. It's, it's just a set volume, but it's a flow rate if we put it over a certain time period. And so liters per second. So do we have this flow rate in liters per minute or liters per second in the question? Oh, liters per minute. So that means I cannot plug it in. So I know my pressure change is five. So now I need to divide 45 by 60 to turn it from liters per minute to liters per second, okay? So when I divide it by 60, right? So when I divide it by 60, I get 0.75. So now that I have 0.75, I can now plug it into my equation. So I got my pressure change, which is 5, over 0 0.75, right? So now I just need to convert this, right? 0.75 goes into 5. How many times? Well, I know that it's going to be more than five times because it's only three quarters, so six, and then when we come down to it, roughly around 6.7, that's what we're looking at here. So our airway resistance is 6.7 centimeters of water per liter per second. Remember your units, right? Especially with that... Um, 
MRE, right, I asked you about the units practically in some of those questions. So the units will be important for you to remember. I want you to remember the units too, because that also is something that helps you remember the equation. If I know the units for raw is seven or is centimeters of water per liter per second, that's how you do the equation. Because the numerator is centimeters of water pressure, and then your denominator is per liters per second. So it tells you how to do the equation if you know the units. Okay, so hopefully that's starting to make sense. So when we're looking at Mr. Beals, does he have a diffusion issue, right, with his alveolar minute ventilation at almost four liters per minute? No, he does not have a diffusion issue. Is he hypoventilating? Uh, no, well, we don't have a blood gas to see if he's hypoventilating. We don't have a CO2 level. But uh, is his lung compliance really stiff or, or really floppy? Well, it's kind of neither. It's not too high or too low. But what's his big issue? Why is Mr. Beals having any respiratory issues, right? And we're assuming that this person's in your care because they have a respiratory issue. Well, what's a normal airway resistance? Remember, a normal raw is 0.5 to 1.5 centimeters of water pressure per liter per second. Okay, so I know that whatever's going on with Mr. Beals is something that's obstructing the flow of gas into and out of his lungs. So in other words, it's not the respiratory zone that's his issue, it's the conducting zone that's his issue. So his problem isn't respiratory zone, his problem is conducting zone, right? It's not how stretchy or stiff the lungs are, it's not how easy it is for gas to diffuse in the membrane, it's something to do with airway resistance. So this could be a case for a, a tumor growing in his trachea, or it could be an aspiration of a foreign body, all right? <laughs> so something like that could be causing his issue. So now you can sort of see these calculations, I know this looks silly right now, come into play where it can actually help you determine what's wrong with your patient. Your patient in front of you has good gas exchange by good alveolar minute ventilation. They have good lung compliance, but when we looked at the air resistance, that was way off, and that's where we need to focus our resources. So then we can go down there with a bronchoscope and see what's causing his resistance. And no, no, lo and behold, maybe there's a tumor there. Maybe there's a foreign body that he had aspirated, right? Maybe his bridge came off from his teeth and they're stuck in his lungs somewhere, right? Something like that could be going on and it's making it hard for gas to flow through his respiratory system to flow through that conducting zone and that's why his resistance and work of breathing is so high so I hope that sort of helps remember this is YouTube you can rewind replay but you can sort of see where all these equations ultimately will come into hey we can actually use these to help someone to help us figure out what exactly is causing someone's difficulties Okay, uh, when we're looking at this, this is something that we looked at before on one of the other PowerPoints, right? We're assuming uh, dead space here. So every time you take a breath in and out, you're going to have gas that doesn't make it to your respiratory zone, right? That's our, your dead space. That's that 1 ml per pound or 1 ml per 2.2 kilos, right? You should know both of those, 1 ml per pound or 1 ml per 2.2 kilograms all right so this sort of tells you how much gas uh, is sort of being caught up how much is not making it to the respiratory zone right we're just going to subtract their dead space from the tidal volume and the more shallow someone is breathing right and we talked about this before this is the same example we talked about before in the previous lecture the more shallow someone's breathing like we have it with patient a here the less they're actually exchanging with their bloodstream, which means they're more likely to have CO2 build up in their system. And if you have CO2 being carried on your hemoglobin molecules, those parking spots are being taken up and oxygen molecules can't get on, right? And so it's going to make it a lot harder for that person not only to get CO2 out of their system, which decreases the pH, it makes them more acidic, as well as it's going to make it hard for oxygen to get 
onto the hemoglobin to get to the organ. So they, they eventually may go into anaerobic metabolism, right? Darn Krebs cycle making its way again. <laughs> so when you get into it, uh, the deeper you breathe, the less of that volume gets wasted on that dead space. And this, so this is something called the dead space to tidal volume ratio. Okay, VDVT. This is something we use in critical care medicine. So you are getting introduced to it here. We look at someone's dead space to tidal volume ratio. And as we make changes on the ventilator, as we make changes on the breathing machine, we look at the VDVT and that can actually tell us if we're going in the right direction or we're going in a direction that is not useful to the patient. In other words, could be detrimental to the patient. We can increase the amount of pressure on the breathing machine. So let's do this. Right? Right? I have my alveoli and my capillary, right? And then I decide, hey, we need more of that P big AO2. We need to increase our P big AO2. And I say, hey, let's increase our pressure. Let's push more pressure in there. Let's increase the P big AO2 by increasing pressure, okay? So I'm increasing the pressure of the, of the breathing machine. But what happens to the alveoli as I increase pressure? So down here, I increase that pressure and the alveoli expands, but now what's happening to the blood flow? It's getting cut off because we're hyper expanding that respiratory zone. So you can reach a point where there becomes decreased perfusion for that ventilation. And it's called your dead space to tidal volume ratio, right? Because remember, dead space is ventilation. So there's gas moving, but there's no perfusion. Right, And so we can actually cause a dead space even with a bigger volume, right? So let's say we increase this guy to 900 mLs, we can actually cause a dead space issue. So this is a calculation, right? The bullet point for this is that we use this calculation to help us see if what we did was helpful or hurtful because what will eventually happen is their CO2 levels will build up. Also, we're gonna start destroying that by hyper expanding that tissue. We'll develop hyaline membrane, uh, which is that scar tissue. And then we're going to eventually cause them to, to have a lot of damage. And it's called Villi, ventilator induced lung injury. And so it's going to be something that we need to take account of when we have someone on a breathing machine, when we have someone on a ventilator. Are we, by increasing pressure, hey, we might be increasing their PO2, but ultimately we might be causing very, very bad damage. We might be causing a dead space issue, which would make them even worse. So you got to be cognizant of this. So that's my whole thing with this. Y you got to look at their dead space to tidal volume ratio when it comes down to it. Yes, the bigger the breath, the more efficient they are. But just like Hooke's law, there gets to a point where that becomes limiting and it can actually cause harm beyond that. So remember the definition of diffusion. Diffusion is defined as the movement of gas molecules from an area of high concentration of gas to one of low concentration of gas. So the different gases will move according to their own pressure gradients. So you're going to see we have CO2, which is a larger uh, gas molecule or, or more mass massive gas molecule have a different gradient that's normal for it than oxygen because it has a different mass and so we're going to go into a little bit of that there but they're all going to move on their individual partial pressure gradients so this diffusion will continue across especially here with the example of a semi-permeable membrane this will keep on continuing to diffuse until all the gases in the two areas reach a point of equilibrium. And that's what you're seeing here. Through that semi-permeable membrane on the right, uh, that semi-permeable membrane in the middle uh, had that diffusion of a higher gas molecule, all those red dots, gradients to a low gradient. And that's why we were talking about at the very first slide when we were show, when we were going over the alveolar capillary relationship for how my P big AO2 is much greater than my PVO2, right? My pressure of venous oxygen. And because my PVO2 is so much lower, remember this is all about diffusion. If I have good diffusion, then my 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 CO2 PVCO2 is going to go into the alveoli. My P big AO2 will go into the blood, right? 
because we have a low PVO2 and a high PVCO2. So when we're looking at this, we're just looking at that diffusion, right? Now we're not talking about hemoglobin here yet. We're just talking about pressure gradients. I have low pressure of oxygen in my venous, and therefore oxygen will go from my alveolar to venous, right? That will turn it to arterial. I have a low uh, CO2 in my lungs compared to my venous, so my venous will diffuse CO2 into the lungs, right, till it reaches equilibrium. So it's all about reaching that equilibrium when we're talking about pressure gradients. Remember, there's no flow in the respiratory zone. It's all molecular, right? It's a molecular movement. So when we're looking at this, that's how everything ultimately happens at the alveolar capillary relationship. So diffusion, what are the rules? So this uses part of, partly um, when we're looking at it of the kinetic equation. So uh, molecules will move from an area of high concentration to low concentration until we reach equilibrium, right? So here's my uh, P big A CO2 and then here's my venous P V, V was venous, right? CO2. My PVCO2, let's just say it's 46 millimeters of mercury. All right, pig, P big A CO2, let's just say it's 40 millimeters of mercury. So I will have PVCO2 go from inside my venous blood because of the pressure gradient going from high to low, 46 is higher than 40, so I'm gonna have CO2 diffuse into the alveoli until it reaches a CO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury in both the alveoli and the capillary, which means my normal PaCO2 in my bloodstream, so pressure of arterial, right? Little a means arterial, big A means alveolar. Right, little a is arterial, big A is alveolar, until my P big A CO2, and what's a normal P, P little a CO2? 40, right? So you see what happened here is the 46 millimeters of mercury that was in my venous side reached equilibrium with my alveoli, which was at 40. So that means once it reached equilibrium, I was ready for a normal CO2 in my arterial, which is 40 millimeters of mercury. They reached that equilibrium. Pretty cool. When we're looking at this, we can actually have a better diffusion if we change some different factors, okay? The time is gonna be one factors. Uh, so if we can increase diffusion if it's over shorter distances, in other words, a very thin membrane, if we have increased temperatures, or if we have a lot smaller molecules or molecules with less mass, all right? So we'll talk about that in a second here. Or the diffusion across the membrane can be increased when there's more surface area. If the membrane is thin, or if we change the concentration of the gradient. And that's what we talked about before is, hey, we have a P big AO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury, and my little AO2 is, let's just say it's 50 millimeters of mercury. That's very low, right? A P little AO2 in your arterial blood is very low at 50 millimeters of mercury. So, let's say for this patient, in other words, they have something going wrong that's stopping the oxygen from getting across into their bloodstream. So this could be like a pulmonary fibrosis where scar tissue builds up and blocks, right? It makes the tissue thicker and it blocks some of that oxygen from diffusing. So how can we help diffusion? Hey, if we increase that concentration somehow of the P big AO2, that can help give us more pressure to have better diffusion. So then if I increase my P big AO2 to let's just say 200 millimeters of mercury, then I might be able to get 
75 millimeters of mercury, which is a lot better for your body to have 75 in your in your artery than it is to have 50 in your artery. And so something happened there where diffusion was poor, and let's just say it was scar tissue forming in the in the alveoli, right? So something was causing that diffusion to be poor, but how do we change this? We increased the P big A O2. Well, how do you increase P big A O2? Well, there are three ways, right? You have your FiO2, then you have your barometric pressure, CO2, PaCO2 times 1.25. I'm running out of room here. So there are three ways to increase your P big A O2. I can either increase my FiO2. I can increase my barometric pressure, or if they have high CO2 levels to begin with, I can get rid of, because remember, this is being subtracted, I can get rid of their CO2. In other words, I could have them ventilate more efficiently. So if someone has high CO2 levels, we're going to help them ventilate more efficiently, and that will help them get oxygen, uh, that will help their P big AO2 increase, and therefore help that diffusion of oxygen into their bloodstream. Same thing over here with FiO2 and pressure. We can change those to increase our P big AO2 to compensate for this increased thickness of an alveolar membrane. All right, so let's go into the gas law. So Boyle's gas law, assuming mass and temperature are constant, pressure and volume are inverse, right? This is what we talked about before. In a large container, the molecules are very far apart, which means it's not going to generate as much pressure, right? If you ever go to a crowded room and then you go to a room where there's like four people in it and it's a ginormous room, right? Can you imagine walking into a store and there's only like three other people in the store, right? There's going to be very low pressure, right? Your, your odds of running into someone else are a lot lower if there's only four other people in the store than there are if there's 400 other people in the store, right? It's all about the, the volume and the size of the container, right? So we can have the same amount of molecules, but if we change the size of the container, in other words, we change to a smaller container over here, those molecules become a lot more concentrated they're going to create a lot more energy and therefore pressure lateral pressure is going to increase so pressure and volume vary inversely right the smaller the container the more pressure the higher the the larger the container the less pressure and we already talked about this agnosium but let's talk about blood pressure for a second if you have a patient that's septic, which is a blood infection, they're going to be vasodilated. Their blood vessels are going to be really wide open. And that means their blood pressure is going to be very low, right? Because we have an increased volume situation over here with the same amount of red blood cells, okay? So their blood pressure is going to be low. So if we give them a medicine that causes their blood vessels to constrict, like a norepinephrine or an epinephrine, we call them pressors, right? They, we give them like an epinephrine drip, right? So it's running through their bloodstream. It'll constrict their blood vessels. What happens to their blood pressure after we give them that? Well, their blood pressure should increase, which in this case is good because it's going to help it so we can get some blood to their brain. We can get some blood to their kidneys. We can get some blood to their heart. We can keep some of their organs alive. Now, some of these smaller blood vessels to begin with, like the blood vessels in their fingers and toes, they're going to probably lose perfusion altogether. But overall, we'll save their brain. So this is something that we even use in the circulatory system in critical care medicine, right? We make these decisions so that way we can, hey, we need to perfuse the brain. We need to perfuse the heart, so on and so forth. Let's give them this medicine until their body is able to sort of fix this infection and we don't need to give it anymore. So that's using pretty much Boyle's Law. We're, we're, we're decreasing that, the size of that container, therefore increasing the pressure. All right, so gas laws. So this is going over another gas law. This is Charles' law. So Charles' law says that mass is constant and pressure is constant and temperature and volume move together, right? So pressure is constant, volume and temperature vary directly 
right? So if the temperature of the gas is increased from 250 uh, Kelvin, let's just say it's 250 Kelvin here. Remember, this is all in Kelvin. Uh, and it's increased over here to, let's just say 300 Kelvin. All right, that's a big increase there. So if we increase that temperature, we're going to have that volume uh, increase as well, right? So let's say there's a balloon, right? Let's just pretend these are balloons here. If these were both balloons and we increase the temperature, well, that balloon's going to start to expand as we go from 250 to 300 Kelvin, right? So as we increase temperature, gas will expand, right? We'll be able to have more volume as it's going in there, right? So are we able to have that expansion overall? We're going to be able to have that change. All right, Gay-Lussac. So Gay-Lussac's where uh, if volume is constant, so mass and volume are constant here, pressure and temperature will vary directly. In other words, uh, if the temperature of a gas is in a container, uh, let's just do this. Okay, you have a cylinder of gas. You have an oxygen tank. Right, very poor rendering of an oxygen tank, but use your your gentle imagination here. Uh, so if we have that volume of gas contained in that tank, right, uh, so that, and we have it set at let's just say this container holds 50 centimeters of centimeters of water pressure. Okay, so that's a pretty low pressure for an oxygen tank, but we want it low for this example for sure. <laughs> Uh, so if the temperature has a pressure of 50 centimeter at this temperature it has a pressure of 50 centimeters of water uh, then if we increase the temperature right if I increase the temperature to um, I don't know from 275 to two um, to 375 let's just, just do 100 so I increase the temperature this is in Kelvin. So if I increase the temperature, so I take this oxygen tank, I go find a truck in the middle of a 100 degree day and I put this oxygen tank in the back of someone's truck and it somehow increases from 275 to 375 Kelvin during that day, what's going to happen to that container? What's going to happen to the pressure inside that container, right? It's going to increase right that's where we're going to have the pressure in that container go up pretty significantly so if you like math right if math makes sense to you this is what you're ultimately doing and your book might have you do this too and so this should be roughly the new pressure inside this container should be 68 centimeters of water pressure so we went from 50 centimeters of water pressure to 68 by putting it in the back of a hot truck, right? So that's ultimately what you're looking at here. The more heat I put onto that container, the more pressure that container has, which is a bad thing in some situations. So the inverse would be true if I had a, a, a container of oxygen and I somehow put it in a freezer, <laughs> uh, it would decrease the temperature Kelvin and therefore I'd have a decreased pressure of oxygen in that tank. So hopefully that's sort of helpful there too. Dalton's Law, one of my favorite ones. So Dalton's Law, uh, says that, hey, the atmosphere of the Earth is not just nitrogen and oxygen. There's other stuff going on. So everything's got to equal up to the total amount, okay? All the parts got to equal up to 100% when it comes down to this. So because the Earth's atmosphere has a lot of different gases, uh, we need to know how they're sort of behaved when they mix together. So the total pressure, right? Here's a definition for you. So if you're writing stuff down, the total pressure is equal to the sum of the partial pressures. So that means everything's got to equal up to 100%, right? So I got to have the right amount of gases that equal up to 100%. Now, medical grade air is just oxygen and nitrogen. It doesn't have CO2, water vapor, argon, uh, nitrogen, or sorry, uh, argon, all those other trace gases that could be in there. It's just 
oxygen and nitrogen, right? But when we're looking at breathing in atmospheric gas, it's a big mixture, right? So each pressure is going to have different pressures in our alveoli, right? That's what the alveolar air equation ultimately does, is it tries to subtract all the gases ultimately until we just see what our big P big AO2 is, and then we can compare it to what our P little AO2 is, right? And see if there's an issue. So when we're looking at nitrogen, nitrogen, uh, when we're looking at the atmosphere, is roughly about 78% of the atmospheric gas that you're breathing. So 78% of the atmospheric gas, when we're looking at 760 being our total, uh, so if it's 78% so we're talking about nitrogen here. If it's 78% of your gases, then it exerts a pressure out of 760 millimeters of mercury. 78% of 760 should be roughly around 593 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so when we're looking at oxygen, oxygen is roughly, uh, let's just say 20.9, right? 20.9 percent when we're looking out of 760 this would be a p big ao2 or or an atmospheric pressure sorry an atmospheric pressure a pb an atmospheric pressure of about 159 you're like derek why are you going over this what's the point of this well a normal p big ao2 in your alveoli right we talked about this a normal p big ao2 is roughly around 100 millimeters of mercury. So where are we losing this 59 millimeters of mercury? Why is that not making it there? Right, not only that, but a normal P little AO2 is roughly around 80 to 100. So as we go from atmosphere to alveoli to in the in the artery itself, we're losing partial pressures. So that tells me the conclusion of all this, and I know you're you're waiting for this, the conclusion of all this when we're talking about Dalton's Law is the more pressure, the more PiO2, pressure of inhaled oxygen we use, the more we can increase P big AO2, which means the more we can increase P little AO2, right? Where if we feed this, if we give the patient more oxygen, if we give them a higher FiO2, then we'll give them a higher P big AO2. And then if their diffusion is doing okay, that'll equal a lower or a higher P little AO2. So hopefully you see the bullet point of, hey, if we use Dalton's Law, if we increase atmospheric gas, right, by giving this patient uh, a nasal cannula of oxygen, right, that increases their atmospheric or inhaled oxygen concentration, which then will increase their alveolar oxygen concentration, which will then increase their arterial oxygen concentration. So someone with emphysema that have destroyed a lot of their respiratory zone, they destroyed a lot of that area, that surface area in their lungs, that's why you'll see some of these patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease on oxygen, right? They'll wear those oxygen cannulas, and that's a daily thing for them. Because what they're trying to do is increase their inhaled oxygen concentration to then increase their P big AO2 oxygen concentration, which should then help compensate for the loss of surface area and increase their P little a, their arterial oxygen concentration, to help their organs perfuse and use oxygen normally. So hopefully that sort of comes to why I'm having you go through this. If you manipulate their inhaled oxygen concentration, that is one way to in manipulate, in a positive way of course, how much oxygen there is in their bloodstream to help perfuse their brain, to help perfuse their kidneys, to help so on and so forth to continue life. All right, so this is why I want you to know your partial pressures of gas, right? So nitrogen 78%, oxygen, let's say 20.9%. Then you have 0.9 of like argon, and CO2 is 0 0.03, so something super low. And I don't know what table it is in your book, um, but it is 4.1 in my book. And so yours should be somewhere around there. I think you guys have a, a newer edition of the book. But I just want you to sort of be cognizant of it. They want me to make sure that you know uh, 
ultimately what happens with this partial pressures, right? As you go from atmospheric to alveolar to arterial, that partial pressure decreases. So therefore, if I increase atmospheric, right, if I give them a nasal cannula of oxygen, if I give them, uh, you know, high FiO2s, then that'll increase their P big AO2, which will then increase their P little AO2. So that's the ultimate end game of knowing those partial pressures, right? So when you're looking, and like I said, your table might be different, it's looking at uh, the, the gas itself, the percent of the atmosphere that gas is, like nitrogen being 78% of the atmosphere, and then the pressure. So they're doing 78% of the 760, right? Which would be 500, what did I say, 593, something like that. So when you're looking at this, this is what you're looking at here. And this is asking you, what happens to the pressure of oxygen between the atmospheric gas when it gets to the alveoli? And when it gets into the bloodstream and you know all three of these what happened to their values as we went further and further down right they all decreased so what happened with pressure of co2 and water vapor pressure ph2o what happened there well when we're looking at this relationship here you see that the oxygen goes lower and lower the further down the lungs we go. Well, why? Well, what does Dalton's law say? The partial pressures equal up the whole. So what happens with your concentration or pressure of CO2 and water vapor pressure as you get further close to the alveolar? It goes like your CO2 goes from being 0 0.03 to being a lot higher. You get a CO2 in your alveoli of 40 millimeters of mercury. So that means you cannot, according to Dalton's law, everything's got to equal 100%, right? You can't go over 100%. Because CO2 and water vapor pressure are increasing as we get closer to the respiratory zone, to, to make room for that 100%, that means we don't have as much room for oxygen. So the further down the airway we go, the less room there is, according to Dalton's law, for oxygen because we have some CO2 and water vapor that's hanging around in there. So that means the further down in the lungs you go, the less room there is to carry oxygen, which means the worse the diffusion ultimately, right? So in a, a high temperature atmosphere, it, it's going to be hard to for oxygen to reach the alveoli. They're diluted, right? So because CO2 and water vapor molecules are hanging around in higher concentrations in the respiratory zone than they are in the atmosphere, than they are in your conducting zone, it's going to make it a lot harder for oxygen molecules to make its way there. And therefore, that's why you have this big decrease of atmospheric oxygen compared to alveolar oxygen, right? And water vapor pressure, that's something else that you got to pay attention to because water vapor uh, is a, a, a volume of water or molecular water and so this behaves according to the gas law and will exert partial pressure right because it's a vapor it's it's in gaseous form right so if alveolar gas is 100 percent humidified which it should be at body temperature we should have an absolute humidity of 44 milligrams per liter and therefore the water vapor pressure is roughly around 47 regardless of the humidity right so because there's more pressure here's the bullet point right if all that just sort of went over your head right here's the bullet point because there's higher concentrations of co2 and water vapor in your respiratory zone than there is in the atmosphere than there is in your conducting zone therefore it will decrease the amount of oxygen from the atmosphere as you get closer to the respiratory zone that's why your pio2 is your pressure of inhaled oxygen which would be at your mouth is going to be a lot lower a lot higher than at your alveoli your p big ao2 because in this area, we have more CO2 and more water vapor that's going to compete for space, right, inside the lungs. So that's why it's a lot harder to diffuse or why the pressure of oxygen decreases as you go from atmospheric, like PiO2, all the way down to alveolar, right? It's Dalton's Law. Uh-oh. We got a math warning. I know some of you uh, enjoy math, some of you may not. That's okay. Let's go through this together.
One of the things I want to talk about here in the alveolar air equation, right? Remember your alveolar air equation, and you guys have gone over it already in math, is your FiO2 and your barometric pressure minus water vapor pressure, which we're assuming B2PS here, minus your PaCO2 times 1.25. Or you could do CO2 divided by 0.8, but that's a whole separate thing. We'll get there eventually. All right, so this is the alveolar air equation. All right, so this tells us how much oxygen is in the alveoli. So when we write this, we write this as P big AO2, and it's in, what's the units? Millimeters of mercury, right? MMHG. All right, this is your P big AO2, right? Alveolar oxygen. So when we're looking at this, there you go. Uh, if we put someone on oxygen, we want to know how much FiO2 that is. So if you, I put you on one liter of a nasal cannula, right, that little tube that we put in people's nose for some extra oxygen, if I put you on one liter of oxygen, then I need, and I want to do this calculation to see what happened to your P big AO2, then every, for every liter of oxygen, I'm going to go up by 4%. Okay, so if I'm assuming, and, and this only works if you're assuming room air is actually 20%, not a big deal, but when you're looking at this, one liter would be 24%. So if I put you uh, from being on room air at 21% to now being on one liter, I would write 24% for my FiO2 or 0.24, right? Uh, or if I put you on two liters, I would use 0.28 right so on and so forth uh, 0.32 so if you're calculating what their change of p big a o2 is you need to put in how much fi2 they are so you'll do this in the hospital you go draw a blood gas uh you'll go um draw blood from someone's artery and you have to write down how much oxygen they're on so that way we can calculate their a to a gradient see if it's getting better or worse well, how much oxygen are they on? Well, they're on 32% if they're on 3 liters, and that's what we'll use, right? So you do need to know the rule of fours when it comes to that. You'll thank me later when you get to therapeutics. So if someone's on 4 liters, 36% oxygen, right, so on and so forth. So normal CO2 is about 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. Uh, so that's just a normal, right, you should get to know here. And then pH2O will leave as a constant. I'm not going to probably vary that at all with the calculations I will give you, but we'll leave that as a constant for now for your class. Um, barometric pressure will vary. If I do not give you a barometric pressure, you have to assume 760, right? You have to assume C level. And the board exam does the same thing. That's why I would do it because the board exams does it does it they're assuming that you're practicing at sea level so a hospital in florida or pick some sort of sea level state that you could imagine yourself practicing at right and so they'll give you an equation they'll say okay calculate their p big o2 and then they don't give you the barometric pressure you have to assume 760. colorado we're around 640 but uh, barometric pressure for uh, sea level about 760 and that's what they want you to put in there so let's try it, right? So if we do uh, sea level, right? So 760 minus 47, and then we have our patient on room air. Their CO2 level is normal. Hey, that's awesome. Uh, that's your exchange ratio. Their P big AO2 ends up being almost 100 millimeters of mercury. That's perfect, right? That's perfect. That's sea level perfect. However, when this same patient goes into Denver, Colorado, where we're closer to 640 for our barometric pressure. So that's the only thing we changed. We become hypobaric, right? So that's the only factor changed. Their CO2 is still normal, right? Their FiO2 is still the same. We don't have less oxygen in Colorado, right? That's a common uh, mistake. Uh, we don't have less oxygen. We just have less barometric pressure. So there's less pressure pushing oxygen to diffuse in your bloodstream, right? There's less pressure to diffuse oxygen into your bloodstream. I'll repeat that a third time. There's not less oxygen available. There's just less pressure 
for the oxygen to diffuse into your bloodstream. And here's proof. You're looking at it right here. Because what happens when we do the same equation with the same FiO2, but with just lower pressure? Right? We're close to 75 millimeters of mercury. Right? Big difference. So when they talk about high altitude having uh, less oxygen, that's wrong. It's not less oxygen. It's just there's less pressure to diffuse the oxygen that's in the atmosphere. So on the top of Mount Everest, that's number three down here. Right? And this can be a normal PO2 for Colorado, 75. That's a great PO2 for Colorado. Uh, not for sea level, but for Colorado, it can be pretty good. So let's look at Mount Everest, right? In case you're wanting to go there after you graduate, you're like, I graduated, I'm going to climb Mount Everest. <laughs> uh, up there, the barometric pressure is 252. Holy cow. So if you're at the top of Mount Everest, you'll actually get to a point where, hey, what is this? The FiO2 didn't change, right? There's no less oxygen up there at the top of Mount Everest. There's less pressure to diffuse oxygen into your capillaries, right? And so therefore, in, actually in this case, this patient goes into what we call pulmonary edema. That means your PVGO2, and it can happen for a number of different ways. And then your, your pressure in your alveoli is less than the pressure of your capillaries. So your capillary pressure, capillary osmotic pressure, is higher than alveolar pressure, and you're actually going to seep fluid from your bloodstream and from your lymph, right? You're going to you're going to seep um, seep fluid into your alveoli. It's called pulmonary edema, and this is actually called high altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE. Uh, so when you're looking at this, that's actually something that could happen if you do have something like that. That's why some people, unless you have your body acclimatized to it, will have to wear oxygen. Now there's like Sherpas and stuff that don't need to wear oxygen up there because they've acclimatized their body to that type of situation. So if they try them on 100% oxygen, it's going to be a lot different. We're going to actually be able to still have that diffusion of oxygen into the capillaries, right? So big difference, right? So try working on it. There's, there's examples in your workbook. And of course, there is work of the alveolar gas equation or alveolar air equation on your worksheet as well. So remember, with that worksheet, we're also looking at the A to A gradient. So you just take your P big AO2 minus your P little AO2, right? And that will equal your ADA gradient. Your ADA gradient tells you how easy it is to get oxygen from here to here, right? It tells you how easy it is to diffuse across that membrane. Now, there's other equations too, but that's just one that just looks at how easy that diffusion is, okay? So practice using that. Now, normal ADA gradient is your age in years divided by 4 plus four, right? So that will tell you someone's normal ADA gradient. So let's say their ADA gradient is 200. Well, that's huge, right? Unless this is Methuselah, right? That's a huge ADA gradient. That's increased. That means it's very hard for oxygen to diffuse into the bloodstream. All right, let's talk about gas exchange a little bit here. So the oxygen that diffuses across the alveolar epithelial cells, remember this is a type 1 pneumocyte, is your epithelial cell. Remember that simple squamous, having your brain go back to the earlier lectures, right? <laughs> and goes through the capillary endothelial cells, and finally into the plasma. And that's what this picture is showing here, right? It's showing it going all the way into the plasma from the alveoli. So it's got to go through an area roughly about 0.1 to 0.1 one and a half um, micrometers, right, in thickness. So it's got to go through some stuff to get there. And where we run into big issues down the road is where scar tissue starts to develop, right, on the alveolar epithelium. And the epithelium gets thicker, right, with hyaline membrane or scarring, and therefore it increases the diffusion length. Right, it's going to make it harder because now we have a thicker membrane for oxygen to diffuse across, and therefore our A to A gradient would increase in this situation. 
right? If we had a thickening of the AC membrane, right? If we had a bunch of fluid like pulmonary edema, it would make it harder. And so that would increase our difference between P big AO2 and little AO2. All right, so this is one of the things that you should be familiar with. So seeing all the stuff that your your bloodstream has to have um, oxygen diffused through before it finally gets into your bloodstream, right? It has to to get gas into your bloodstream. You have that diffusion that has to happen, and so it's important that you understand if there's anything that changes with your capillary membrane, right? If your if your pulmonary capillary is vasoconstrict then there's less blood flowing through your lungs and there's less ability to pick up oxygen and get rid of CO2. If your alveoli start to collapse and get atelectatic, then it's going to decrease the amount of gas that's going to be able to diffuse into your bloodstream. Uh, if the thickness of the alveolar membrane itself increases, right? We have scarring, we have swelling like we see with pneumonia, right? We have all that stuff that's happening. Well, that's going to make it harder for oxygen to go through that membrane. So it's very important you understand there's there's a multiple multiple faceted thing that's going on with the alveolar capillary relationship and that's where we have a lot of issues with some of our patients all right so the transport summary I like this screen a lot when we're looking at the transport summary this is sort of the diffusion pressure so if you're more mathematically inclined this might help you right if this gives you anxiety uh, then just sort of take it slowly but this is what we're looking at here uh, as I was drawing earlier, our P big A O2 is 100 millimeters of mercury. Our P big A CO2 is around 40 millimeters of mercury, right? So dry air up here, normal P big atmospheric gas. <laughs> normal atmospheric gas is 760. By the time it gets to the alveoli, much lower, right? We're losing some of that to water vapor and CO2 pressure, right? Our P atmospheric uh, pressure of oxygen is 160, but as we get down past our conducting airways because of Dalton's law, we get to the PBGAO2 of actually 100 millimeters of mercury, right? So you're seeing what's going on atmospheric up here, and then what's going on alveolar right down there. So we're losing some of that. Remember, that's Dalton's law taking effect. All right, so in our alveoli, we're assuming a perfectly functioning adult here. So in the, with this perfectly functioning adult, we have a P big AO2 of 100 and a P big A CO2 of 40. So when we're looking at the venous, venous blood, venous blood has a PO2 of 40 and a PA, PV, sorry, PV CO2 of 46. So I have higher CO2 in my venous blood than I do in my alveoli. So therefore, CO2 will diffuse in, right? My PO2 is only 40 millimeters of mercury. Therefore, my oxygen, which is higher in my alveoli, will then flow in. Right, so I have the elimination of CO2 because of a pressure gradient 46 to 40 until it reaches equilibrium. And then I have the insertion of oxygen because I have 100 millimeters of mercury and I only have 40. So because of that gradient, oxygen will diffuse into the bloodstream. And because of the CO2 gradient, CO2 will diffuse out of the bloodstream, right? All this happens until it reaches equilibrium. That's why a normal pressure of CO2 in arterial blood is 40, right? It reached equilibrium over here, right? 40, 40. Uh, PO2, if we had perfect diffusion, 100, 100. Everything happened until it reached equilibrium. Well, then it got transported, right? And then it went to our tissues, and that's where we exchanged the reverse, right? We have a higher PAO, PAO2 is high, but in our tissues, which are using up oxygen, so the tissue oxygen is low, so therefore we're going to send oxygen into the tissues. And then our CO2 in our tissues, because our tissues are creating CO2, right, is high. And compared to how much CO2 is being transferred to the system, it's low, right, because it's arterial blood. So therefore, CO2 will enter, right, 
enter it into the bloodstream. So then it can go back to the lungs and eliminate the CO2, right? This is that normal circulation, right? That's where those pressure gradients come into play. Now we'll get into more complexities later, but this is sort of just that pressure gradient gas transport. So if I increase PaO2, if I increase my atmospheric oxygen by giving this patient a mask of oxygen. So if I increase PiO2, right, if I put this patient on a lot of oxygen, I will then increase P big AO2. Right? See how it increases P big AO2? Therefore, that will help increase P little a O2. Well, if I increase P little a O2, then that means I'm going to deliver even more oxygen to my tissues, which will then help my tissues be more effective at um, being metabolically non, uh, being uh, metal, uh, aerobic, right? Non aerobic uh, organisms. In other words, they'll have a normal functioning system. They'll maintain their pH balance. They won't go into anaerobic metabolisms. They'll stay with gas, they'll stay with oxygen. Okay, so I think this one has a typo. Let's go through this one. So oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse across the alveocapillary membrane. You do need to know normals for venous arterial and alveolar. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit here. When we're going through this, uh, normal venous blood, PVO2, so oxygen in the venous blood is 40 millimeters of mercury. We know that it's higher in the alveoli. And therefore, right, if we have perfect diffusion, once the venous blood goes to the alveoli, it should reach equilibrium and equal a P little AO2 of 100, right? It should reach equilibrium and we'll have a P little AO2 of 100, right? So we have venous blood going to the alveoli, but then reaching equilibrium right there. All right, PVCO2 is 46 millimeter mercury. So this venous blood is going to the alveoli where the PACO2, big A CO2, is 40. So that will reach equilibrium when it gets to the alveoli, and therefore when it diffuses and goes to equilibrium, your arterial blood will then have a P, A, and um, CO2. That's the typo here. P, A, CO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury. Yeah, there's a typo there. Okay, so please correct that on yours, right? So your PaCO2 in arterial blood should be 40 mils of mercury. It was just missing the C there. So when you're seeing this, the diffusion pressures are different between CO2 and O2, right? You have a gradient of 140 for oxygen, and then you have a gradient of 6, right? Of 46 and 40, right? So you only have a gradient of 6 for CO2 compared to a gradient of 60, right, for our oxygen. So that's a big difference, right? So CO2 pressure gradient is only 6 millimeters of mercury and compared to 60 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. Why? Right? Oxygen molecules will move across the membrane um, into the blood around the same way, right? But tell me about the molecules themselves. Right. Why? Why? What's which one? Or is there a difference between the molecules? Does one have more mass? And this is where the periodic table comes into effect. Does one have more mass? Does one have more size? Right. Is there a bigger molecule and a smaller molecule? Right. And will those change the way that they diffuse? Right. So let's do a mental experiment here since we're not on campus. A mental experience. Uh, the faster blood moves through the respiratory system, the harder it is to reach that equilibrium time. So during exercise, if you guys are perfectly healthy, you're going to have blood go through your AC membranes at a faster rate, which is okay. But you're just going to have less time for that oxygen and CO2 to reach equilibrium. So in healthy lungs, this 
will happen no matter how uh, how fast and how hard you run but if someone does have a diseased lung so if someone has emphysema someone has chronic bronchitis someone has asthma someone has something that's currently going on with their lungs it may not be enough time for them because of their lung function it may not be enough time for them when they exercise to reach equilibrium and therefore their oxygen levels will drop drastically when they get up to walk from the bed to the kitchen or from the living room to their dining room so this is why you might see people that have different oxygen levels when they have to get up and walk around the block or go to a store. So we might have a patient that has COPD and when they're sitting at home watching uh, the TV, they might only need two liters of oxygen when they're sitting or resting. But when they're up walking around, they might need four liters of oxygen because their body doesn't have enough time to reach equilibrium because their surface area is reduced. Because their ability to diffuse is reduced all right so this is a picture from your book I love these pictures from the book because they're way more complicated than they need to be in my opinion anyway so my personal opinion but if you like them go for it uh, so this is so short of showing oxygen moving past the alveoli their pictures are a lot better than mine for sure uh, so we have a PVC PVO2 so if we're looking up here this is venous blood a PV and you see there's a little V with a line over it here the 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 line over the V means it's mixed venous which is a fancy way of saying it's blood that's coming from the pulmonary artery okay so if you see a V with a line over it it's it's not a different language it's just meaning that it's it's mixed venous which means it's blood that's coming from the pulmonary artery okay so no need to worry yourself right so this is venous blood coming from the pulmonary artery to the lungs to help some of the capillaries, right? So our PVO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury. And normally, and then you see me filling in these lines here. Normally, we only need 0.25 seconds, right? A quarter of a second. That's insanely fast. We only need a quarter of a second for that diffusion to reach equilibrium. And then we have perfect right equilibrium we have oxygen and everything now it it can happen if your lungs are diseased it takes longer right it can take uh, a lot lot longer so ultimately you have up to 0.75 seconds to do this so someone that has emphysema someone that has destruction of lung tissue like pulmonary fibrosis where there's scar tissue and diffusion is decreased anything that sort of hurts the alveolar capillary relationship so if we have destruction or hurting of the alveolar capillary relationship then it's going to take a lot longer longer to diffuse a lot longer to reach equilibrium and that's why they may not have enough time to keep their oxygen levels up if they get up to walk around us we have a reserve right so then instead of doing the first quarter of a second it might take us a half of a second for them it might take them longer than three quarters of a second and that red blood cell hasn't had time to equilibrate because there's less surface area all right so we're going to have that issue with people that do have lung disease having that decreased um, saturation level or decreased oxygen level because they 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 lost surface area they lost the ability to equilibrate All right and this is sort of showing someone that's having that, that uh, that's under stress or exercise right your heart rate's increased therefore your blood is pumping faster right so the blood's being pushed a lot faster over here right big arrows like your blood is being pushed a lot faster so you here you are doing the Zumba class right and your blood's going a lot faster okay so still you have a quarter of a second that still should be enough time if you have healthy lungs to reach equilibrium because that's how much it only normally takes anyway so we're taking away some of the savings account we're taking away some of the buffer zone of the three quarters of a second to now a quarter of a second but that's okay as long as you're healthy your oxygen level should not change if you go run up and down the stairs or go do a Zumba class right your oxygen level should stay relatively the same as long as you have healthy lung function so there's a test we do in the hospital and in outpatient called the six minute six minute walk test right six mwt six minute walk test and we're going to take a patient we're going to put an oxygen uh pulse oximetry we're going to put a, a little thing on their finger that tells us their oxygen levels and we're going to walk them for six minutes 
And then we're going to see if their auction levels stay up or if their auction levels drop and so on and so forth. And we can sort of see what, uh, in a roundabout way, what their limitation to exercise is or what their limitation or how far they can go and how well functioning are their lungs overall to daily activities. And so this is one of the things that we'll be looking at with the six minute walk test when you guys get to diagnostics class. And this is exactly what we're looking at. If your lungs are healthy, th then it then your oxygen level should stay relatively stable during the test. If your lungs are sick, they may drop during the test and you might have to require oxygen while you're walking around or while you're moving. All right, so if we have thickening of the alveolar membrane, so let's say we have inflammation and swelling that occurs with pneumonia, right? So we have a thickening of this AC membrane here. It makes it a lot harder for gas to diffuse through a much thicker membrane. So as we're going through here, it's going to take a lot longer to reach equilibration. And in fact, because this there's so much tissue that the oxygen and CO2 has to diffuse through, we actually don't get all of it done. So that's why someone with severe pneumonia, right, otherwise might be healthy and they wouldn't need oxygen when they get up and walk around and all that other stuff but when they catch a very bad pneumonia which has a respiratory zone swelling right swelling of the respiratory zone with pneumonia their oxygen levels might drop drastically with just a cough or walking from their bed to the bathroom in the hospital right so that's a very very bad situation because there's not enough time there for that diffusion to happen isn't that crazy so we're going to start talking about diffusion law. So there's gas laws and diffusion law. So you should know the difference between the two. Graham's Henry's fix are diffusion, and Dalton's um, is a is a gas law. When you're looking at um, Boyle's. Charles Gay-Lussac's those are all gas laws as well. This is about all about diffusion across that membrane Just like we talked about in one of the opening slides there We're looking at that diffusion and how easy it is to get across the membrane and notice that it has fixed law Right, so there's the three laws. We have Henry's Graham's and fix the thing with the fix law and the fix sort of combines everything together it's looking at the rate of gas across tissue being directly proportional to the surface area of the tissue. So over here, if we have um, an alveoli, 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 and we have capillary beds that run across, I have good surface area. And then over here, I have emphysema, and I have one alveoli, and blood that flows across there. Well, am I going to be able to get as much gas on the emphysema lung? Diffused compared to the normal lung? No, right? I'm going to have less diffusion because I have less surface area. I don't have as much surface area going on there. So when we're looking at fix, it's sort of looking at the surface area, the tissue, the tissue, the diffusion co constants, and we'll talk about that there, and then how much pressure there is between the two types, right? And then this also looks at the thickness of the tissue or how thick the AC membrane is. So it's sort of determined, so fixed law, right, is determined by Henry's and Graham's law. So that's why fix is sort of highlighted here. Fixed law is determined by Henry's and Graham's law. So let's get into this a little bit. So Henry's law, this is where we have gas under pressure. When it comes in contact to a liquid, it dissolves until it reaches equilibrium, right? Depending on the pressure and the solubility of the gas, that's what it will take. Which is, which is more soluble in a liquid, oxygen or CO2? So this is kind of an important concept because are you dealing with CO2 and oxygen in your AC membrane? And the liquid that we're talking about here is going to be blood, right? So when we're looking at this, which one is more soluble, oxygen or CO2? So when we're looking at this, solubility uh, is looking at under constant pressure and temperature, right? How easy it is to go into that liquid, right? And it varies on the basis of the mass of the molecule. So the solubility of CO2 is 0.592 and the solubility of oxygen is 0.0244. Um, don't ask me how I remember that. 
It's so one of those weird things. Uh, thanks, photogenic memories. Uh, so when you're having this, the CO2 has a much higher soluble, uh, higher solubility into the liquid, right? Until uh, it, when it's doing this, mostly because of the mass of the molecules. It's that that weight or mass of that molecule. So that's why we only need a CO2 gradient of six millimeters of mercury. Remember, our PV CO2 is six mil, uh, 46 millimeters of mercury. Our P big A CO2 is 40. It's because the CO2 is much more soluble, right? We need a higher oxygen gradient to get to sort of that same solubility, right? It's very, very light. It's a smaller molecule. It doesn't have a carbon attached to it, so it has less, less mass, and therefore we're going to need a higher concentration to make up for that. So it's like a 24 to 1 um, relationship. So CO2 will diffuse 24 times greater than oxygen, and that's what we're looking at. It's mostly due to that mass. So when you're looking at beverages, right, your carbonated beverages, what's in there? Is it CO2 or oxygen that they put into the, into those carbonated beverages, right? It's CO2, right, because it has much easier solubility into that liquid, right? Pretty cool. So we don't need much of a pressure gradient for CO2 because it has that mass. Right, so CO, solubility of bodily fluids, CO2 is very soluble, that's what we were just talking about. Oxygen is less soluble, 0.0244, uh, right, compared to 0.59, I want to say. So nitrogen also has a low solubility, and most of the time, by the time you get down to the alveolar level, you will have hardly any nitrogen that gets down there, right? Uh, so CO2 will diffuse faster according to Henry's law. That seems like it's an important point to remember. Because it has more mass, it will have a faster solubility, right? It has more inertial impaction. And this is where I talk about uh, the game Red Rover. Hopefully you guys remember the game Red Rover. Uh, two groups hold hands, and then they're going to send someone over until they break the hands of two people in the other group, not break the hands, but just break the the hold, I guess, of those two people. So if I have um, Shaquille O'Neal, who has a lot of mass, and then I have a smaller person, let's just say uh, Richard Simmons. Okay, hopefully you guys all know who those two people are. So Richard Simmons, smaller guy, Shaquille O'Neal, a little bit bigger guy, right? Shaquille O'Neal has bigger uh, mass. So if I send him over and you're holding hands, even though he's not moving fast, he has a lot more inertial energy, let's just call it. And uh, he's, he's able to probably break that bond a little bit easier. So he's going to be very soluble. He's going to be able to break through there pretty easy. Little Richard Simmons, you know, love Richard Simmons, right? Uh, as he goes through there, has a lot less inertial um, energy. And so even though he might be a little ball of energy, he his mass is just not as big as Shaquille's and he's gonna have a lot harder time breaking that bond so to compensate we need a lot of R Richard Simmons we need a lot of them to make up for that gradient so when we're looking at oxygen and co2 co2 in this analogy and I hope it makes sense is gonna be your shack uh, um, and then your oxygen is going to be Richard. Uh, <laughs> smaller, so we got to have a higher gradient in order to get that good diffusion. But that's what we're looking at here is that solubility of Henry's law. Uh, so CO2 just will diffuse faster because it's a higher mass, a lot easier, more inertial impaction. What we're looking at partial pressures in the alveolar capillary membranes. So remember, blood that arrives in the pulmonary artery has low oxygen and high CO2, and that's where the concentration of the gradient causes oxygen to enter the blood from the alveoli and CO2 to leave the blood into the alveoli to get released. So this allows for the gas to ultimately reach equilibrium, so Henry's Law. So one of the cool things about Henry's Law is we actually use this in the hospital. We have hyperbaric chambers where we put you in this little uh, chamber and they're single place and multi place where you can dive with patients. Um, and you put the patient in this little chamber <laughs> and we make this chamber hyperbaric so we increase 
barometric pressure. So what happens with this patient, and mostly it's wound care or carbon monoxide poisoning, something like that usually, we increase the barometric pressure in there and we're using the partial pressure, right? We're, we're manipulating the partial pressure on the patient's body surface area to increase P ultimately, P little a O2. If we increase P little a O2, that can help with whatever condition we're diving them for. So when we're looking at Henry's law, we can increase solubility if we increase the pressure, right? Well, remember, CO2 is a more massive molecule as far as mass goes, right? Look at the periodic table. if Because it has a, C, a carbon attached to it. The other one does not have a carbon attached to it, right? CO2 and O2. One has a carbon, one doesn't. So if we increase the pressure... If we increase the impaction, then we can increase ultimately things like PaO2, right? So even with hyperbaric chambers, in other words, we're increasing barometric pressure. So instead of 760, let's say we're going at 780, right? So we're increasing barometric pressure. We can actually use Henry's law to help get more oxygen into someone's bloodstream because we're just creating more inertial impaction. We're creating more pressure. Uh, we're increasing p big a o2 that much more pretty cool i think anyway we're increasing p big a o2 right the more we increase p big a o2 the more we increase p little a o2 all right graham's law so graham's law states that a lighter gas it is the faster it will diffuse so that's just the rate right we're looking at the rate it will diffuse so this means oxygen a lighter gas we already talked about that co2 and o2 one has this carbon attached to it the other one doesn't and so it will diffuse quicker right so the gram molecular weight of oxygen is 32 and then gram molecular weight of co2 is 44 so 32 it moves faster right we talked about richard simmons and shaquille o'neal a second ago if you know who they are if you're not please take a second to if that if the analogy you think will help you look that up if you don't don't okay so what we're looking at here with graham's law is it'll move faster so between someone really big and a lot more mass and moving slower compared to someone smaller and moving faster right one has more inertial energy behind it because of its mass the other one has to have greater numbers but it will move faster right it has a faster movement and just because it's faster doesn't mean it will diffuse better right it just says it will diffuse faster right its rate of diffusion will be increased okay so that doesn't have anything to do with the concentration there they have to increase the concentration because they don't have as much pressure they don't have as much mass but there once it does diffuse it will diffuse faster because it is a smaller molecule so the rate of the diffusion uh, is is proportional to how big it is ultimately so when we combine Henry's law and Graham's law right so we're looking at how easy it is to go into the membrane right so when we're looking at this the diffusion of carbon dioxide and oxygen uh, differs uh, about 20 times faster co2 can diffuse 20 times faster than oxygen because of the mass and that's why we have to have that higher gradient for oxygen and a lower gradient is is all we need for co2 it's that inertial impaction yeah it can diffuse quicker it can diffuse faster but we have to have a higher concentration remember we had a p big a o2 of 100 and a p v o2 of 40 That's a big gradient. So it'll diffuse fast, but it the it needs a bigger gradient because it has less less mass. And CO2 has a higher mass and is a lot more soluble, so we we can get away with a smaller gradient. So PV CO2 is 46 and PA CO2 is 40. So we only need a gradient of six for CO2. It's of 20 times faster to diffuse CO2 than it is oxygen, or 20 times more efficient, I should say, for, to diffuse CO2 over oxygen.
So fixed law, and that's what we were talking about at the very beginning here. So fixed law uses all of these together, it uses Henry's and Graham's together to look at diffusion, right? So this one combines the surface area, right? So that's the essay over there. So you're looking at the surface area and then the diffusion constant, which is the Henry's and Graham's law combined, and then the perfusion or pressure gradient over the thickness of the membrane. So this is putting it all together. Fick's law is putting Henry's and Graham's together and saying, here, let's define perfusion. If we increase pressure, okay, so let's put this together in a what does this mean moment for you guys. Okay, if I increase the pressure gradient, so if I give a patient uh, three liters of oxygen, what happened to their P big AO2? Well, you should say, Derek, well, it increased, right? We increased their P big AO2, and so I've increased the pressure gradient. I've increased my P big AO2, right? So if I increase the perfusion gradient, right, and they already have a thick alveoli, I'll help overcome and have better diffusion into their bloodstream. What if I increase their surface area? Let's say a bunch of their lungs were collapsed, right? They had atelectatic lungs, right? And I gave them some pressure to help them breathe a little bit deeper. And I let their lungs open up again. So I have a lot more contact, a lot more surface area compared to this little shriveled up alveoli over here. So if I increase surface area, I'm gonna have a lot better diffusion of oxygen compared to this little diffusion over here. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if we do somehow change the diffusion constant, that's a constant, so that's not something there. Uh, that's going to change things as well. So the other thing here that's the factor is going to be the thickness of the alveolar capillary membrane. So here you see uh, a recruited alveoli, a nice open, easy to go alveoli compared to a little shriveled up allotactic alveoli. Here if I have someone that develops pulmonary fibrosis, where there's a bunch of hyaline membrane and scar tissue that pretty much starts developing in their type one pneumocyte, it's gonna be very thick, right? And so no matter how much I increase my pressure gradient or surface area, it's gonna be very hard for it to diffuse. Now to compensate for this thickness, I will have to increase my pressure gradient. I will have to see what I can do about surface area, but it sounds like this thing's gonna require a higher pressure gradient, so either oxygen or pressure, right? So applications, so what does this come down to? Surface area right the ability for oxygen to enter the pulmonary capillaries so this is where we were talking about atelectasis right we have the little floppy versus the wide open one has a lot more contact than the other right a lot more surface area with the wide open alveoli than we do with the shriveled up alveoli so atelectasis can play a big factor in getting oxygen to the bloodstream. That's why a lot of people after general surgery or abdominal surgery, they'll have lower oxygen levels because they're not taking big deep breaths because it hurts or it's painful after abdominal surgery to take a big breath. And so their lungs will start to close down and become atelectatic. And that's where they can have things like where they develop pneumonia. But if we give them the therapy or intervention to help reopen that lung tissue, have more surface area, that will then decrease the amount of oxygen supplemental oxygen their body needs, right? Uh, pulmonary edema, we actually already talked about this too. Pulmonary edema, we have a bunch of fluid that, uh, especially the, the Mount Everest thing, right? If we're on Everest, the pulmonary edema is where we have fluid leaking into the alveolar, uh, into the respiratory zone. So that will decrease surface area ultimately, because what happens to the surfactant in your alveoli when we add more fluid? Will it dilute it or concentrate it? Right? It will dilute the surfactant that's in your alveoli, which will then cause your alveoli to become atelectatic, right? Which then decreases surface area. Isn't that crazy? Okay, so surface area. So we see this with patients that have pulmonary edema and atelectasis. What about the pressure gradient? Well, hypoventilation and high altitude would be good examples of this, right? Anything that decreases P big AO2 will reduce diffusion, okay? So if I hypoventilate, if I take a lot of uh, pain meds, and I'm not saying I do, but I'm just giving you examples out there. If a patient, let's go with that direction, feels 
a lot better doing that if a patient takes uh, too much uh, uh, pain medicine that causes them to breathe really shallow and uh, a very low breathing rate. They'll have a low uh, breathing rate so that what will happen to their CO2? If they're not breathing very deep and they're not breathing very often, the CO2 in their body will build up, okay? So they're hypoventilating. Okay, so if I have a bunch of CO2 stuck in my alveoli, right, and we talked about this earlier, where the atmospheric pressure of oxygen compared to the alveolar pressure of oxygen compared to the arterial pressure of oxygen, because of Dalton's law, it decreases as you go down. So what happens if my CO2 starts to build up in my alveoli? I'm hypoventilating. So as that CO2 builds up, it takes up more of the pressure or gas pressure, right? Dalton's law is still in effect. It takes up more of the space, if you will, in my respiratory zone, and therefore I won't be able to get near as much oxygen. So my P big AO2 actually decreases as my P big AO CO2 increases. So in this patient that took too many pain meds and is hypoventilating, I can't, I'm going to have a lower P big AO2 because my P big A CO2 is taking up more space. Hopefully that makes sense, right? I have a lower P big AO2. I have a lower pressure gradient, right? We're looking at PA to little PA, like big alveolar oxygen compared to little arterial oxygen. So if I have someone that's retaining CO2, right? Hypoventilating. That can easily be a cause of, right, the pressure gradient decreasing. Or high altitude. We talked about this, right? Mount Everest, I think it was, what, 252 for the barometric pressure, right? A lot lower. So they climb in altitude, I'm going to have a lower P big AO2, and therefore I'll have a lower pressure gradient to get oxygen to diffuse into the bloodstream. And then finally down here, point number three, is the thickness of the alveolar capillary membrane. And this is where we're talking about like pulmonary fibrosis, where a bunch of scar tissue builds up, right? And it makes it hard for gas to go through that really, really thick tissue. Uh, interstitial edema, interstitial edema where, remember we have the tight space and the loose space, right? So the tight space is the actual exchange of gas here, but the loose space, and let's go to red, is this area here that doesn't have capillary contact and it's mostly like lymphatic tissue. If this loose space, right, uh, fills up with edema and third space fluid, it can actually push away the capillary and then cause less surface area. It can make it a lot thicker and harder for the gas to move across, right? So alveolar fibrosis, interstitial edema can decrease the ability for oxygen to get into the bloodstream. And so when we're looking at this, how do we treat it, right? We have someone that has pulmonary fibrosis. We have someone that's climbing Mount Everest. We have someone that took too much pain meds. We have someone whose lung tissue is closed down. Well, what are some of your, your interventions? What can you do about it? You're like, Derek, you tell me all these things, but I don't know what to do about it. Don't we do something about this? Isn't that what this is all about ultimately? Yes. So what do you do about it, right? We can increase, just like the alveolar air equation, we can increase the FI too, we can give them more oxygen, which would ultimately increase their P big AO2, right? And therefore increasing their diffusion into their bloodstream. So therapeutically, we can do something. We can give them FiO2, right? The more FiO2 we give them, the more barometric pressure we give them if we're doing hyperbaric therapy, right? The more we're helping their, them ventilate with their CO2, the more likely we are to help them fix that problem or at least compensate for that problem until they get better. Okay, so perfusion limited gas flow and then we'll talk about diffusion limited gas flow. So perfusion limited gas flow means that the gas moving across the alveolar capillary membrane is only about only related to the equilibration of the amount of blood moving through that membrane. So once the gases reach equilibrium, the diffusion stops, right, until it goes into the, into the our alveolar capillary system. So example of this would be laughing gas or a gas that we use for anesthesia. So here is your alveoli. Let's make our alveoli blue. And then we'll make our 
capillary. So this means, remember, we have our PVO2 and then PVCO2. Okay, so that means that we have these little red blood cells in the plasma moving past the alveoli. Okay, so nitrous oxide or laughing gas is a quick example of this. So when we're looking at this, this looks at the pressure of N2O in your alveoli, and it will only keep entering as long as there's a higher pressure of, in your alveoli compared to what's in your blood. So if you have very slow moving blood, if you have low blood pressure, right, if you're very hypotensive, then you're going to reach equilibri equilibrium very fast, right? It's going to equilibrate and there's so much time that that blood is dwelling there that it's going to be very easy for it to reach equilibrium very fast. Now over here, you have high blood pressure, okay? And then here's your alveoli, and then your nitrous. So now you have red blood cells moving very fast through here. So there's not gonna be near as much time for it to do that. And so as we increase perfusion, we'll increase diffusion. Right, So we'll have a lot more of the nitrous that enters their bloodstream with the high blood pressure than we do with the low blood pressure, right? Because we only entered until we reached equilibrium, but we have to wait for more blood before more of it gets into their system. Over here on the right, we have really, really high blood pressure. Blood's moving fa really, really fast through there. Yes, there's less time, but as long as their lungs are functioning normally, they're gonna have more volume of laughing gas go into their system faster. So the only thing that limits how much nitrous goes into their bloodstream is actually how much blood is moving past or what their perfusion is. So if you have an increased perfusion, that means you have the increased ability, right, to pick up that gas. If you have decreased perfusion, that means it's sort of decreased. So it only looks at how much until you reach an equilibrium, until you reach that. So the faster the flow, the more you absorb a lot quicker. So this person's gonna go into general anesthesia a lot faster on the right that has high blood pressure or a fast heart rate than the person on the left because they get a lot more volume into their bloodstream a lot faster. So the only thing that's limiting the gas from flowing into their body is just how much blood is going in there. So if I increase blood flow, I increase perfusion, I increase perfusion, right? I increase blood flow, I increase the amount of gas going in. So let me ask you this. If you are hypoxic, right? If your body has low oxygen levels and it's trying to pick up as much oxygen as it can, what's it going to happen to the heart rate? Is it going to slow down? Or like in the nitric case, the nitrous case, sorry, if in the nitrous case, we were able to get more oxygen by having better perfusion, increasing our blood flow through that area. So your body is going to tell your heart to beat faster and stronger so that way you can pick up more oxygen, right? So that's one way of looking at perfusion limited. The more perfusion there is, the more oxygen you'll get in there. The less perfusion there is, the less oxygen you'll get in there. So it's only looking at the partial pressure gradient, right? So you're looking at that pressure gradient to reach equilibrium. The more blood I push through there at a higher rate, the more gradient that contains and stays in there, right? So in order for a diffusion to keep going, you need more blood to keep going into the alveolar system. So you, need, you determine the amount of diffusion right when you're looking at how much blood is going through there. Decreased perfusion means decreased diffusion. Increased perfusion means increased diffusion. I'll repeat that again. Decreased perfusion means decreased diffusion. Increased perfusion or more blood flow means increased diffusion or more gas that can cross over, right?
So diffusion limited gas flow is a little bit different. Diffusion limited means the, the gas moving across the membrane, across the alveolar wall, is looking at the alveolar capillary membrane itself. So over here, we have um, your AC membrane and your capillary, right? And with this, the, it's saying that the only thing that stops gas from going in there would be or slows it down would be like the thickness of the tissue. So it make it a lot harder for gas to go into the tissue with a very thick alveolar capillary membrane compared to a very thin alveolar capillary membrane, right? So it's a lot harder for gas to get into your bloodstream with a very thick AC membrane, like what you see with pulmonary fibrosis, um, emphysema, in pulmonary fibrosis, emphysema destroys, right? Emphysema, you have the alveoli, but there's little areas that are cut off and destroyed because of the emphysema, right? And there's a pic better picture later on in the PowerPoint of this. And we have less surface area, and so we're going to have less diffusion because there's a lot less ability for gas to go into the bloodstream because our alveoli is destroyed. So this is the integrity of the alveoli. Diffusion limited is the integrity of the alveoli. Perfusion limited is the integrity of the blood flow. I'll repeat that again. Diffusion is the integrity of the alveoli is in question. Like a thick membrane or a destroyed membrane like we see with emphysema. And then perfusion limited is to do with cardiovascular. We have a poor pump, the right side of the heart's not pumping well, or we've lost a lot of blood with an accident, things like that, that or we're vasodilated with a blood infection, right? Things like that are happening. So perfusion limitation is more cardiovascular, diffusion limitation is more pulmonary in association. So when we're looking at this, uh, during strenuous exercise at high altitude, uh, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, those are all diffusion-limited areas, right? We're going to have the issue of diffusion limitation, right? The integrity of the AC membrane itself uh, will be the thing that decreases diffusion, right? So it's important to note when we look at them combining with hemoglobin, and this is going to go into the next area when we talk about the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, once an oxygen molecule combines itself to this red blood cell over here, they form their own special relationship where the oxygen, once it combines, no longer exerts a partial pressure. Right, so it is not going to be exerting a partial pressure anymore. Okay, so what happens here is we have gas that goes into right. So up here, if you look at the right underneath the gas, where you the alveoli, so we have oxygen that goes both into the bloodstream and it will stay in the plasma and exerts a PaO2. So PO2 is oxygen in the plasma. Well, what happens when that PO2 goes on to a hemoglobin molecule? Well, when it goes on to hemoglobin molecule, when it gets transferred to hemoglobin molecule, it no longer exerts a pressure. So what happens to your PO2 when the oxygen decides it wants to hitch a ride on a hemoglobin molecule? Well, the PO2 decreases, which means now there's still a pressure gradient for perfusion, right? So for more gas to keep going through there. So when gases combined with hemoglobin, they don't exert a partial pressure anymore, and it actually helps to keep a pressure gradient, so you can actually carry more oxygen. So what, what's, what's something that we can do to look at this a little bit easier? So carbon monoxide is a common uh, example here, and it, it loves being attached to hemoglobin. And in fact, it has a, a higher diffusion than oxygen, and especially when we're looking at hemoglobin. So carbon monoxide's affinity for hemoglobin, according to Desjardins, is 210 times greater than oxygen. Now, Egan says 200, but Desjardins says 210 times greater than oxygen. So, how can we look at someone's diffusion, right? You're like, Derek, can we actually see into 
how well someone's diffusion is. And yes, there's a pulmonary function test called the DLCO, diffusion lung carbon monoxide. So we're going to have the patient breathe in 0.03%, 0 .03%, 0 .03 uh, carbon monoxide. So very, very low carbon monoxide. Hold their breath for about 10 seconds and then exhale. We're going to see how much carbon monoxide we gave them compared to how much carbon monoxide we exhaled. So if the patient exhaled almost 100% of the carbon monoxide they inhaled, then we know their diffusion is very poor because carbon monoxide loves to go in and attach itself to hemoglobin molecule. So if the patient exhales almost the same concentration of carbon monoxide that we gave them on inhale, then we know their diffusion is very poor. So that could be something like emphysema or pulmonary fibrosis. If they exhale hardly anything compared to what we gave them, right? If they, if they inhale that carbon monoxide and they exhale almost untraceable carbon monoxide, then we know that their DLCO is increased, right? They have good diffusion. Right, so this is actually something that we use, uh, and it's a measurement. So we look at their diffusion at 25 milliliters per minute per pressure per tor, right, per millimeters of mercury. So when we're looking at that, that's how we can actually look at someone's diffusion. So someone that has emphysema, someone that has destroyed lung tissue, I can actually look at their diffusion over the course of every couple of months when they come in for a lung function study, right? You as the respiratory therapist will actually be doing this test. You'll have the patient take a deep breath in, they'll breathe in that mixture of gas, and then after 10 seconds, they'll exhale, and you'll be measuring both the amount of carbon monoxide that went in and the amount of carbon monoxide that came out. And then what's missing is ultimately telling us about their diffusion. If, they're, if they didn't have hardly anything crossed over, then that means their diffusion's getting worse. All right, so this page here looks at sort of different things that can cause limitations with your patients. Ultimately, uh, so these are clinical conditions that will decrease diffusion ultimately. Uh, and these are all diffusion limited problems. So the first one up here is atelectasis, the alveolar collapse, right? So we're limiting the rate of diffusion over here because what's happening with our surface area, right? When we're looking at fixed equation, our surface area is increasing or decreasing? Well, we have less surface area, so we are obviously going to have a diffusion issue if we have less surface area. Okay, so atelectasis, decreased surface area. What about the thickness, right? Well, remember Fick's law? It's all over thickness, right? The thickness was that denominator there. We have a very thick alveolar membrane. It's making it a lot harder. Okay, Fick's law says that would make it a lot harder to diffuse. What about over here with pneumonia and consolidation? Oh, absolutely. What happened to the uh, ability to go through that liquid, right? You have to diffuse gas not only into the alveoli, but also through that liquid and into the bloodstream. So that increases the thickness or the length that it has to travel to get into the bloodstream. So that will also be diffusion limitation. Now remember, none of these have to do with perfusion limitation. So what's an example of perfusion limitation? Well, if I have someone that develops a blood clot, like a pulmonary embolus, I have a lot of blood over here, but almost no blood getting past there. That would be a perfusion limitation, right? So I have oxygen going down here, but there's no perfusion to really go past it. And that would be a perfusion limitation condition. All these up here in this picture are diffusion limitations, right? What's going to stop the oxygen from getting into the lungs is diffusion. And that's what we're looking at with most pulmonary diseases is going to be a diffusion limitation. Okay, so frothy secretions like pulmonary edema, that's going to be a diffusion issue, right? We're going to have all this extra frothy secretions that's hanging around in there. So we're going to increase the length that the oxygen has to travel, right? Interstitial edema, right? This, this happens, uh, especially with pneumonia, interstitial edema can happen with that one. And you see how I was talking about this before, much better drawing than what I could do. But you could see how that, that third space tissue is pushing, uh, pushing the the alveoli and the capillary away from each other. It's separating that beautiful relationship there. 
that's terrible, right? Boo, <laughs> right? We're going to increase the thickness and it makes it a lot harder for oxygen to transfer across. And finally over here, you see how much airways have been destroyed here with emphysema? Just destroyed, destroyed. And so emphysema destroys that surface area and eats away at it. It's very, very uh, bad. And that's why they're going to have a diffusion limitation. So what's your fix for diffusion limitation, right? What do you do? You give them oxygen right in the meantime now obviously we'd want to fix what's causing the issue if they're atelectatic and their lungs are closed down we want to see what we can do to help them reopen those areas if they have um, pneumonia we want to see what therapies we can do that would be helpful if it's a bacterial pneumonia antibiotics right so we're going to still want to ultimately treat the issue that caused it but in the meantime while the oxygen levels are low in their bloodstream what do you do Right, and that's what you're looking at here, right? You want to do what you can to treat them. So give them a higher FiO2, give them some pressure until that you can fix the underlying cause. So most of the conditions, right? The bullet point from this is most of the conditions you will be dealing with with pulmonary disease are going to be diffusion limited, right? Diffusion limited. And then you're going to have issues with perfusion as well, most of those have an etiology of cardiovascular, right? Most of those are heart uh, and blood vessel related when we're looking at that. So when we're looking at this all together, we're looking at something we have to take into account, both perfusion and diffusion. And if we're dealing with lung disease, we're usually dealing with a diffusion limitation and we need to figure out the cause there. Well, tell me in, um, in, uh, something that I, uh, an equation I can use to look at diffusion, right? Well, how, what I'm asking for is an equation I can do at the bedside to see how easy it is to get oxygen from here to here. <coughs> so when we're looking at this, this would be our A to A gradient, right? I'm just taking my big A minus my little A and seeing what the diffusion is there, how easy it is to get oxygen from one side to the other and so that's ultimately what you could be looking at we do have other equations but that's just one I want to bring out there so the bigger the gradient the more diffusion issues we have the lower the gradient the less diffusion issues we have so when we're looking at the lungs can oxygen be either diffusion or perfusion limited what do you think so when we're looking at normal conditions, resting conditions, the partial pressure of oxygen, right, the one that's in the capillary bed is equal to the pressure of oxygen in alveoli, right? So when the blood is about a third of the way through the capillary, um, beyond that point, the oxygen is perfusion limited. In other words, it's related to the blood flow. So if they have a low cardiac output, if they have low blood pressure, or if they don't have enough hemoglobin, right, if they're anemic, uh, that what can cause a perfusion limitation, and that can cause the increase in the ability to that cause the decreases in the ability to carry their oxygen. So the diffusion of properties of the lungs are impaired, um, but the partial pressure of the capillary bed is going to be a big thing to look at here, right? So the diffusion of oxygen is usually perfusion limited, but in just certain cases, like what we've seen here, uh, like an abnormal condition like emphysema or pulmonary fibrosis, uh, then it can become diffusion limited, right? So usually it's perfusion limited, but in the case of pulmonary disease, it's diffusion limited. I'll say that again. In the case of normal, healthy lungs, oxygen is perfusion limited. But in the case of a diseased lungs, it's usually diffusion limited. So when I'm looking to see what's causing my patient, so let's give you a scenario. You're in the critical care unit as a respiratory therapist, right? Mentally put yourself in a hospital ICU bed right now right a, high, a hospital ICU bedroom right and you have a patient whose oxygen levels in their bloodstream are very very low and the doctor wants to find out why why are their bloodstream oxygen levels low and so you can think of either being perfusion limited or diffusion limited so if you do the 8a gradient and you see the 8a gradient is 9 
but you see that their blood pressure, their mean arterial pressure is 55. Well, that's a decreased blood flow, right? Their blood pressure is very, very low if their mean arterial pressure is 55. So that tells you that they have a perfusion limitation and not a diffusion limitation. Okay, put yourself in the patient in the room next door. Same thing. The doctor says, I got a patient and their blood oxygen levels are very, very low. Tell me the di tell me what's going on. What to work on? Do I work on their cardiovascular or do I work on their lungs? Right? Who's to blame? Why are their oxygen levels low? So you do the 8A gradient, and the 8A gradient is 200, and their and their blood pressure, their mean arterial pressure is 100. So their mean arterial pressure is really good. Their perfusion is really good. But their diffusion, because their ADA gradient is increased, is low. That tells you that there's a pulmonary disease going on. There's something that's blocking the oxygen to go through the AC membrane. Okay, let's do another example. I love this stuff. Hopefully you do too. So we got a patient. Um, they had uh, an issue earlier where they had a GI bleed. They were bleeding in their, in their stomach, an upper GI bleed. Their oxygen levels are really low. We put them on the ventilator. They're on the ventilator. The doctor asks you, hey, their blood oxygen levels are really, really low. Can you help me figure this out, right? What, are, what do we work on? Where do we focus our resources? And so you do the 8A gradient. And let's say their 8A gradient is 5, right? 5 millimeters of mercury. Hardly anything. But when you look at their blood, uh, their, their blood pressure is just fine. But when you look at their labs, you see that their hemoglobin level is really, really low. Well, they're anemic, right? Their red blood cell lo level, their, their hemoglobin level, they're low. And so this would be a perfusion limitation. So this patient needs more packed red blood cells. So we give this patient a blood transfusion that should fix their oxygen levels, right? So hopefully this is going to start coming together for you. I want you to sort of see the end game of going through the 8A gradient and looking at diffusion versus perfusion limitation, right? There's a difference, right? We treat them differently. One of them is usually treated cardiovascularly. The other one's usually treated pulmonary-wise. We need to figure out if it's an emphysema, if it's interstitial edema. We need to figure out if there's a fibrosis going on or a pneumonia going on, right? We're going to treat them differently. And you can be a big part of focusing the sources of, hey, it's pulmonary or, hey, it's cardiovascular. Right, and there are patients where it can be both, but I want you to sort of be a part of that critical conversation. Right, what are your thoughts that this could be a diffusion limitation? Right, if you yourself go calculate the 8A gradient, or what we do in the hospital is more of a PF ratio, but if you go and do that and you see that their their pf ratio is increased or their 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 diffusion gradient is increased right their ada gradients increased then you can sort of see and you look at the red blood cells and hemoglobin and those are all normal right their blood pressure is normal then you know that hey our fo our focus should be on is this a pneumonia right should we be focusing on bacterial versus viral pneumonias things like that Right, you're going to be that much more of a better healthcare provider for your patients, and you're going to feel happier about your job too. So it's kind of a cool thing. So hopefully you sort of like where this is going. I, I know it's a lot of information, but I think you guys deserve to sort of see where all this information ends up. It's kind of nice seeing the why behind this information, not just the torture behind. It.